I, I don't mean this as a as a political pronouncement, but I would say that the markets are basically saying that Trump is winning the trade war. Good day and welcome to the Short Vol Show, sponsored by Guerrilla Trades. And today we have a special interview with Adam Zing, otherwise known as the Balance of Trade on Seeking Alpha. I think you'll find this interesting and it's very um, apropos with the current situation with the trade imbalance and tariffs. Um, please support me in this program by going to the link below and, and uh, donating five bucks or ten bucks to Patreon. Um, it would really help out. I really need your support to keep this show going. I know a lot of people have made a lot of money trading out there and you got a couple bucks. If you don't have a couple bucks, then just give one buck. But I, I desperately need my patreon to grow so this is talking to you don't delay L link down below it takes like two minutes to give a buck and you won't even notice it's gone but it will help me hugely so thank you very much and on with the interview with adam i'll talk to you on the other side David Lincoln Productions. contained in this video is for educational purposes only. Everybody's financial situation is different, so some strategies covered in this video may not be appropriate for you. Trading in leverage products is risky and should only make up a small part of an overall investment strategy. To become a better trader, you need to take personal responsibility for any trading losses. Views of people being interviewed are not necessarily endorsed by this channel. We try to present many opposing views and let you decide. David is not a licensed financial advisor and is not trying to sell you anything. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. All right, we're back on. That just went blank for a second. Uh, sorry about that. Okay, so I'm back on with Adam. Um, yeah, so what I was asking you, uh, you actually, um, are you okay to start again? Sorry about yeah. that. Okay. Um, do you actually have um, people that you follow on Seeking Alpha? Oh, yeah. I have a, a number of people that I follow. I, I don't know the exact number. And regardless of the number that I technically follow, um, I'm definitely reading articles with, with regularity. Um, I, I like uh, Sven Carlin. I think he does a lot of cool videos. Um, I enjoy top-down charts. Um, there is another group, uh, Citylytics. Um, and I'll look at um, Jeffrey Snyder. Um, I'll look at Fear and Greed Trader, the Heisenberg. Yeah, just a, just a number of different people. Um, for me, I am pretty careful to try and read a cross-section of uh, positive and negative uh, viewpoints. Um, it's, it's really easy to kind of get into a place of confirmation bias where you just read people um, that you agree with. Um, and, and I think you actually see a lot of that on, on Seeking Alpha. Um, so, so to me, whether I happen to agree with somebody or not, I actually go out of my way to you know, read what they have to say. Um, and, and I think that's one of the strengths of the platform if you allow it to be uh, a strength. But you have to kind of work against your own human nature to, to you know, make it work that way. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And I think, uh, I think all of us have to try to strive. I mean, I try to strive myself to not isolate myself uh, around people that, you know, uh, and now I'm sort of talking sideways about politics in the U.S., but, you know, I, I try to not just isolate myself politically and um, because the um, the the um, polarization of the United States politically is something that's really hard to get away from. It's like all around us. And and it's great that Seeking Alpha and also some of these other forums uh, kind of. Um, police themselves to not get too into politics, you know, and if somebody starts talking too politically, they get shut down, which I think is great because there's plenty of platforms if you want to talk about politics out there. 
Right. Yeah. Now, now I have seen a couple instances where things I, I've had little baby conversations of um, re relating to politics, and I have had you know the editor come back and say, "Sorry, we don't we don't allow you to cover that." Oh, really? Um, hmm, interesting. Going back six months, seven months, the last time it even happened, um, and it, it actually didn't even have anything to do uh, with Donald Trump. It was a more it was a different topic. Um, so I, I do think that maybe they're a little bit too careful with it at times because sometimes it is relevant or you're trying to make some kind of larger, you know, meta argument. Um, on the other hand, yeah, I definitely think that investing is investing, politics are politics. And um, while there is sometimes a confluence, a lot of times people try to bring a political argument to um, or they bring their political baggage to an investing forum. And yeah, that's not necessarily what we all need to hear or read. So, well, no, be, beyond that, it just, it doesn't make you money. I mean, if you just right. voting, vote, trading with your vote and vice versa, doesn't end up making you money. I mean, I can attest to that. Um, and many people can attest to that by, you know, they vote voted on whichever election based on their trading. And it's hard to decipher, you know, it's hard to predict the market based on politics because it's only one of many aspects that goes into trading, it seems. No question. No question. Now, I do think that politics have played a really important role in markets. And, and I'm thinking more um, like Fed politics and aftermath and the interaction between monetary policy and fiscal policy. Um, that's what I'm speaking to. Um, over the last uh, 10 or 12 years, basically, um, Kind of right up leading into the crisis and since the crisis uh and and i do believe that right now we're in a really sweet spot and we're trying to uh take the training wheels off as it were um monetary policy is still negative if you look at you know uh, fed funds rate versus core inflation um, and to be 10 years into an expansion with four percent unemployment and have negative uh real rates on a fed funds is uh, in my mind, that's that would still qualify as being accommodative. Uh, and and I, I don't think we've sort of seen the end of that story. I, I'm not saying that it has to be some sort of apocalyptic, horrible end. I'm just saying that we haven't seen the end of that story. And, and you've never seen the end of any story, right, in fairness. Um, but what I'm, I guess what I'm getting at is I think there is still plenty of, I think that there is, plenty of this story um left if you will um so in, in oh, of, sorry go ahead uh, sorry it, it, and largely in terms of uh i do believe that central banks have underwritten markets specifically by trying to ta uh, tame down volatility um i think that it's that that is the actual target um and so they're now that inflation is picking up and now that the economy is picking up, um, that is great and that is market supportive. Um, but the question is, uh, will the Fed, will these central banks still have um, you know, risk assets backs? Um, and I think it's going to be a lot trickier for the answer to be uh, yes going forward. It's just, it's just my belief. So um, does the stock market... is? It, uh, there's been a lot of news uh, reports lately and, and articles saying that like the stock market is completely disconnected from the actual economy of the United States and the well-being of the American people. And like what the average person in the street is making has nothing to do with whether the stock market is doing well or not. Um, to me, as a student of uh, economics and the markets, I know that the stock market is related in a broad sense to, to people's well-being, certainly. Um but um, do you think there's like a growing disconnect now between the stock market and, and, and the actual economy of the U.S.? Or, or has it always been that, that way? Um, well, yes and no. Yes and no. First of all, I, I heard uh, Josh Brown say on CNBC like five years ago, I love this quote. He's like, the stock market and the economy are second cousins. Um, they're related, but they're not like, you know, parent, child or sibling. They're, they're sort of related. And... Um, another of my very favorite uh, sayings that I've heard anywhere was uh, David Darst, um, and he said that markets don't change when fundamentals change, markets change when beliefs change. 
And we are in secondary markets and secondary markets are necessarily going to be uh, largely sentiment driven. And it doesn't mean at all that they don't uh, take fundamental data into account. Um, however, a lot of what accounts for the movement in a market, um, even a lot of the momentum in the market is just what traders believe that other traders believe that other traders believe, um, you know, is going to going to happen. And you expect that at some point, um, to the extent that you believe in something like a fair value or intrinsic value, uh, and to the extent that you're right about that intrinsic value, you would believe that you, somehow markets will one day get there. Um, but you know, there's the famous uh, markets can remain irrational much longer than you can remain solvent. So right, right. <laughs> want to take that with a with a major major grain of salt and there really are there are just so many uh dynamics speaking to the idea that there's this big disconnect between markets and um you know fundamentals i think it really depends i think valuations are very high um i think that the if you look at forward operating pe's they're not so bad um, I'll, I'll very readily grant you that. Also, we are seeing a lot of earnings growth. And so um, I think if you were a bull, say, between 2016 and the present, uh, then in some very real sense, you've been vindicated. Um, and I don't see any compelling reason why all of it has to stop starting tomorrow and we have to you know, descend into the pits, um, economically speaking. Um, on the other hand, you're basically looking at the highest price sales ratio on the S&P of all time, even including the peak of the 1999 uh, dot-com bubble. And uh, price sales ratios are essentially the product of uh, price earnings ratios times profit margins. And what I think a lot of people don't understand today um, is that profit margins are at an all-time high. And we can have arguments or debates as to how cyclical profit margins are. Um, in other words, there, there is this kind of group or class of people that say um, profit margins are hitting a new level, a new kind of average. And OK, fine, that's, that's fine. But I have to tell you that we haven't had a recession in 10 years. Um, and I, we've had interest rates purposely kept very, very low for a long time. We have a uh, we have a tax situation where taxes are going to have to go up. Tax rates are going to have to go up um, because of what debt levels are doing. And we're not in a recession. And it's very difficult for me to imagine how that doesn't impact profit margins at some unspecified point in the future. I'm not saying like in the right. next six months. Right. I'm saying in the next six years. And so um, when you buy a stock, you are buying a perpetuity. And I, I think it's somewhat naive to believe that these are the, this is the new level of profit margins. This is the new level of operating margins for the S and P 500, um, and or or it's somewhere near here. And these profit margins are something like 80, 90 percent higher than the than the average, than the oh, long term wow. average. Oh, wow. um, and so uh, that to me is kind of the. Uh, the, gen the genie that's in the bottle that likely at some point will come out of the bottle. And, and that's where I think speaking in aggregate price sales is a better way of looking at the market right now than say like forward operating earnings. Um, I don't mean to say this. I'm, I'm, I don't mean to keep going on here, but, but I don't mean to um, say this in kind of some cynical perma bear type of way. I want to be clear that at some point, I think the best way to look at the market's long-term returns won't be based off of a metric like, say, price sales. And looking at something such as forward operating earnings will be a better uh, way of thinking about the markets. Um, so I'm not trying to say that one metric is always better than the other metric. Um, but I do believe if you're thinking about 10 or 15 or 30-year forward-looking returns, um, that the price sales valuation metric is probably a more accurate uh, indicator right now. Um, are, are you at all worried that um, it's been reported that China is in a bear market now? Is that should we be worried about that? Like a couple different markets. Maybe they said, I think maybe even uh, Japan's in a bear market or something. Is, is, does, 
does that spell doom for us at some point? Uh, you know, I think a bigger issue is uh, not so much China, but Italy. Uh, I think Italy's got some some big issues in terms of having the capacity to draw, um, you know, drop near term bombs on on our markets. Uh, there has been this big billing of a trade war between the U.S. and China, and and maybe it is. And I, I got to be honest here, I haven't like followed this super super closely. Um, but the way I read it is it's more of a terms of trade war. Um, and the terms of trade is basically just saying the, the trade agreements um, that we have or to the extent that these trade agreements are being honored um, is, is something that we're not happy with and it's something that needs to change going forward. Um, China is a mercantilist economy, um, I, depending on how you want to define it, but they are an economy largely based on um, investment like capital build and net exports. They are not an economy based on consumption. Um, and the U.S. is not in that in that same boat. And so um, I, I don't mean this as a as a political pronouncement, but I would say that the markets are basically saying that Trump is winning the trade war. I mean, you've got the Russell 2000 hitting um, all time highs. You have the S&P um, on the doorstep of full recovery um, and you have China in, in a bear market. Um, and my read on that situation is that the markets are saying that this isn't a trade war, that this is a terms of trade war, and that the U.S. is going to win that terms of trade war. Um, and I, I think that's at least a, a pretty reasonable um, assessment. Can you can you explain what, what you mean when you said that China is not a consumer-driven economy, or is that what you said? It is not... Yeah. Yeah, GDP is always based off of four components, right? You've got consumption, you have government expenditure, you have investment, capital spend, and then you have net export. And most, much of China's economy is driven by, um, by net exports and by uh, government spend and by, by investment. Um, and, and by extension, what that means or implies is that relatively little of the Chinese economy is based off of domestic consumption. Okay. Uh, contrast that with the U.S., and I think it's like close to 70% of our economy is based on uh, consumption. And so, um, yeah, it's it's just a it's a very different dynamic. And if you're looking at the stock market of an export-driven economy versus looking at the stock market of an you know domestically domestic consumption-driven economy. They should not operate in tandem. They shouldn't behave in the same way. Right, that makes sense. And and uh, who more? Sorry, I just uh, no, no. Go he, ahead. Go ahead. Does does the? I would argue that in this case, the seller needs the buyer more than the buyer needs the seller. Um, in other words, if we we can just keep this game going. I mean, we can put tariffs on China, and then they can put tariffs back on us, and then what are we going to do? Just slap more on on them because. Um, in terms of the economic model, their economic model is more driven by international trade, and they are the net exporter. Ours is driven less by international trade, and we are the net importer. So, hey, if you want to, if you want to start a fight, this is essentially the buyer starting a fight with the seller. And and I think in this case, it's reasonable to uh, say that uh, that the U.S. will win that fight. Um, again, I. This is really important. I do think there's a big difference between a trade war and a terms of trade war. Um, because in a trade war, the necessary consequence is that there's going to be less trade. That's the necessary consequence. But the terms of trade war, that's not the necessary consequence. Um, it's, it's just trying to rebalance the degree to which one uh, group is a net exporter or a net um, importer to or from the other. Um, and, and one could argue that in the long run, given enough time, it will result in more trade. Uh, and, and so this is, a, this is a, a distinction that's subtle, but I think is quite important. And it also explains why it could be quite reasonable for the U.S. stock markets to be saying hitting all-time highs while the Chinese stock market is in a bear market. Yeah, that makes that seems to make a lot of sense to me. Um, I always thought that, like, when um, Donald Trump was saying stuff about how there's a trade imbalance between us and another country. Like, for example, if 
one country is buying more of our stuff or we're buying, you know, money's, it's not balanced how much we're buying of another country's products and they're buying of ours. I always thought that like there's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're like robbing us of money or something. It doesn't, it's not always going to be, it's never going to be balanced between which companies buying, which countries buying from other countries. It's just sort of more of a, a, um, uh, whichever is the more efficient country to make this product is going to make this one. And uh, it, it's a thing of efficiency and uh, it, it doesn't really matter uh, what the exact balance is between two countries. Is, is that true or, or am I um, thinking about it the wrong way? Well, I, I would say that there are many, many economists that would completely agree with what you just said. Um, and my, my take is that, um, a more common sense way of looking at it is more of like a, a checkerboard or a chess pe- a chessboard. And, you know, you've got your, your dark tiles and your light tiles. And if you imagine those being different periods of time and, hey, in this year, you sold me more than I sold you. And then two years later, I sold you more than you sold me. And we kind of go back and forth. Um, to me, that is a very reasonable model at that point, or even if we're running slight uh, trade imbalances. But if we're right, right, um, running large trade imbalances um, and our debts are piling up and the things that we're buying are largely, I hate to say it, but just crap, like consumer toys and expendables, things that end up in, you know, junkyards. Well, if you run a negative uh, current account balance, which we do, um, then that means that you have to run a financial account surplus, meaning that you are selling, um, you know, foreign investors, foreign governments, um, your, uh, your treasuries, your debt, your stocks, your real estate. Um, and the idea that the U.S. would perpetually say, like over the every year, basically for the last 40 or 50 years, be buying toys that end up in a dumpster um, and selling stocks and bonds and real estate and the nation's debt and say that that's not a problem. While I understand that technically from an economic standpoint in La La Land, that may be true from a more practical standpoint, that just doesn't pass the sniff test. At least it doesn't for me. So in a um, sense, like. We for China, for example, like we sell if uh, if we buy a bunch of stuff from China, then U.S. dollars go to China and then they've got all these U.S. dollars, which they could come back and like buy our real estate or our bonds and own more and more of like our stuff because of those dollars that are going out of the country. So in a sense, um, um, yeah, it's bad in that way. Or I mean, because some people turn around and say like, OK, well, if another country um, um sells us a bunch of stuff and has our dollars, then they have to take our dollars and invest back in our stuff as opposed to other people's stuff. But I guess it doesn't always work that way because currency can be sw- switched around pretty easily. Yeah, that's true. And I, I, one of the best people you asked about, like, who do I follow in Seeking Alpha? And I, actually, I haven't seen him uh, write in a while. Maybe I've just missed it. But uh, there is a professor who teaches in China um, who I believe like ran a trading desk um, in the U.S. for a number of years, and he is extremely knowledgeable about international trade, especially as it concerns China. His name is Michael Patisse. Um, I, I think it's P-E-T-T-I-S. I'm not positive about the spelling. Um, anyway, he really uh, breaks a lot of this stuff down and goes down to like uh, economic identities, things that mathematically just have to be true all the time. Um, That's interesting. And he looks at the economic arguments and then he breaks down more to just common sense. What does this mean or how does this play out? Um, and speaking to it, you know, at some point, the borrower owns the lender. Yeah, the, there's the famous saying that um, if I owe the bank $300,000 and I can't pay, I've got a problem. If I owe the bank $300 million and I can't pay, the bank's got a problem. Yes. yes. Um, right. And so. Uh, to some extent, if you owe any one country a ton of money, like does that country ever want to declare war on you? Because as soon as they declare war on you, like that that debt is all erased. Um, even if they win, what happens, right? It's it's just gone. Um, and so I can see where strategically there are definitely benefits to being a debtor ma- uh, nation, because um, to some extent the debtor owns the the lender. Um, also that also that oh. terms of trade argument you are making, like. It makes a lot of sense in the context that like uh, there's so much 
private business going back and forth between China and the United States. And, and that's going to continue no matter what. And it's just kind of like the government is just sort of sort of mediating that in a sense. You know, it's not going to stop. It's not like all of a sudden we're just going to be like, oh, we don't we're not going to trade with them anymore. You know? Exactly. Yeah. What, what are they going to do? I mean, uh, when when it really comes down to it, these are um, the two largest economies in the world, depending on how you want to measure. I mean, you could maybe say the European Union. Um, but between the European Union and China and the United States, it's not like uh, trade is going to grind to a total halt. Right. Um, but, you know, even when you're married, it's healthy to have fights. It's healthy to argue. Um, it's healthy to say to your spouse, if you feel like things aren't fair, it's healthy to say, I don't think I don't think this is fair uh, and and, you know, have a dialogue. And so um, that process, no most people don't like to argue with their spouse. Most people don't like to fight, but fighting is important. Um, and ultimately, it leads to a healthier marriage and uh, better relationships going forward. And so, that is the difference between a terms of trade war and a trade war is, um, you know, yeah, you, you want to have these fights so that you can go on to have a healthier relationship down the road. So um, let me just ask you for a second. Last time uh, we were talking, uh, I think, I think it was in March, maybe. March, yeah, yeah. in March. And uh, the terms, Vic's term structure was up, was upside down and all over the place, and uh, it kind of looked like it was gonna stay that way for a while. But it seems like now we've just kind of reverted back to where we were in, uh, you know, um, the years before. In a sense, I mean, we're looking at Contango building up towards ten percent again now, and uh, is is that going to be just seen as a blip and and we move on from there i mean i know like uvxy and svxy have been nerfed to a sense and uh and uh there isn't uh, you know there's more controls a little bit in the market and stuff but it it, it seems like um it just sort of got shaken off uh, what's what's your read on that right now i think some of that is is fair uh if we think back to late january early february and what precipitated this um, we were getting a more um, some hotter inflation read uh, readings, and also uh, treasury yields were were headed up, and treasury yields were going higher and higher, uh, and and they were doing so rapidly, um, and so people may or may not remember, but what got that whole fiasco really started was the very positive jobs number um, on I want to say it was like February first. Um, and the market just kind of plunged on, on that, uh, on that jobs number because of what it meant for monetary policy, because of what it meant for inflation. Inflation. Yeah. 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 And so, um, w w the economy is in a good place right now. Um, how much do you want to complain about 4% unemployment? How much do you want to complain about even headline inflation with rising oil prices being below 3%, uh, core inflation being at 2.2, um, Fed funds rates are going up. It looks like they've got four uh, increases over the next, you know, several quarters, um, and which I, I agree with. I think that's a good thing. We're winding down the monetary base. There's a lot of different things happening all at the same time. Um, but what we need to keep in mind is that we've got positive earnings figures and we've got a good, strong economic backdrop. So um, I think that the markets are in a state right now where I, I would not use the word comatose. I wouldn't say that things are crazy or overextended. Um, I think that this is a pretty fair place for them to be. We've seen that, uh, that markets can, can move on a dime. Let's not forget that last Monday. Um, so today is what July 13th. Um, and, and we're hitting S and P 2800. Um, not this past Monday, but the Monday before that, we opened at 2702 or 2700, and we've gained about 4% um, yeah. in those two weeks. And I bring that up, I mention that, um, because yes, we've sort of uh, crossed a uh, psychological hurdle, but really all we have to do is think between, uh, say, mid June and the first week of July, and there was action. Um, let's not forget that the spot VIX was like at 17 a little over a week ago. Um, so, so yeah, I think the, the place that the term structure is right now is, is quite reasonable. Um, and, and I do think that we're going to see some spats and stuff, but 
but I wouldn't be saying myself, like, I, I don't see how we get into the contango of three months ago or four months ago in any kind of hurry. Yeah, it's like a trade. And my friend Andrew would say, this is a tradable market right now. It's like, you know, it's moving around and stuff's happening. And, uh, which is a, a, a good thing. So, um, so moving forward with balance of trade, um, um, so it's coming out like what, like, is it once a week now or twice a week? How, how often does it come out now? Well, it's summer right now. And I have a lot of, um, other outside commitments in terms of teaching, in terms of, uh, just travel. My wife and I were at a friend's wedding in Estes Park, Colorado. Oh, nice. Uh, so yeah, I, the market volatility bulletin, if you, if you actually look, it's, it's coming out about three, four times a week. Um, and I'm trying to, you know, get the formula right there in terms of how often that comes out, how often, uh, other kinds of topics or articles that I want to write about, uh, come out. Um, there is a, uh, a really good math department at the Scottsdale community college because they're a feeder school for Arizona state. It's like a 15 minute drive, uh, to ASU. Um, and a lot of students from ASU actually just take classes at, um, Scottsdale community college. Um, so they've offered me a job uh, to teach math there full time. Um, oh, congratulations! And, nice. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. And what the, the first semester, it's like they basically just gave me gave me the classes that are left over. I mean, it's uh, it's it's fine, you know. But what I'm more excited about is uh, they were were trying to have conversations about how to um, incorporate, like, say, our programming or statistical methods uh, classes um, that are higher level um, and that involve like statistical analysis and, and markets and that kind of thing. And, and so uh, to me, that's, that's a project that's on the horizon that I could see uh, somehow dovetailing with the balance of trade. Uh, I don't know exactly how I would do that right now. Um, I just got the offer like last week. Um, but yeah, so that's something that I'm excited about. Um, and the, the market volatility bulletin, I enjoy writing it. At this point, it's something that I kind of have down cold. I know how to write it. Um, and so it doesn't take that much time for me to write it. Um, and so I suspect that that'll still be something that's coming out three, four times a week. Um, but what I'm more excited about are the other kinds of uh, topics that I want to you know cover. Um, I just want to make sure that it doesn't take up too much of my time because these articles they can take a very long time to write and um, they can be um, sort of intellectually fulfilling. But, you know, if you've got a family and you've got work responsibilities, do you want to be spending six, seven, eight hours writing articles that people kind of look at, read it, make some comments and then move on with their lives? Um, I would say that the answer is probably yes, but it has to sort of lead to something, whether that's monetizable or whether that's, um, you know, just like a, a bigger form of conversation. Well, we, we, I can definitely speak for us, um, who love to read your stuff every week. We love, we love, uh, checking it out and definitely appreciate it. And I, I definitely, what I do is I, I, I get a whole bunch of new Twitter people to check out from your, your, a lot of times I'll go to your sources and I'll start following them or, or whatever articles, uh, you know, you'll lead me down uh, some rabbit hole into the net somewhere from your, from, because you're able to aggregate a lot of what's going on that I've usually missed. And, uh, I know that my group on Facebook also definitely appreciates, uh, appreciates all your content and people talk about it a lot. So thank you so much for your, uh, your commitment to the, the VIX world. Um, you know, we're a small, we're a small community, but we're definitely growing and, um, you know, you're, you're a big part of it. It's, it's nice. Uh, it's definitely not a lot easier to do a second interview with you because like the first time you're like talking with someone, it's very, uh, you don't know what's happening and it's very nerve wracking. So this is a little bit easier this time, which is great. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it's great. And, uh, I appreciate that. Thanks for the kind words. And, the way that I sort of anticipate or ex expect or hope people use balance of trade is I go on every day and I probably look at, I don't know, 30 or 40 visuals and I look to cobble together seven or eight or nine pieces that I think are conversation uh, starters or at least food for thought. Um, I try and put things in there for people that are uh, beginners or are at any given level. 
And I'm not trying to get people to do everything that I recommend or anything like that. It's just a way of quickly reading something in hopefully three or three to six minutes um, and being able to, you know, maybe just get a supplementary perspective. Well, it all feeds into being a successful trader, all these little bits of you never know which little tidbit is going to sway you in one direction or another and, and really, you know, flesh out the picture for you. And I, I know we all go to different spots for our info, but um, that's definitely a, a, a great resource for me. And I know for so many other people and it, it's definitely um, I, I know several of the people that you cover regularly on Twitter and they definitely it's definitely uh, a motivator for somebody to to see, you know, being included in your in your stuff. I'm thinking of people like uh, Pat Hennessy or um, uh, Matt Thompson or somebody like that. You know, it's like it's definitely like an ego boost and it, it, it makes them uh, it, it reinvigorates them to keep up with the great Twitter content when they see someone like you cover them, you know. Well, you know, and a lot of these people, they work so hard and uh, it's. I, I wish I could put everybody on there all the time. Of course I can. It would no longer be a bulletin at that point. <laughs> um, and uh, So I do go on. I do look. I, I want to see uh, great visuals or commentary and things that spur people to think and then hopefully to go on to Twitter and uh, follow. I had no presence on Twitter to speak of um, until uh, one of my, my readers, Adam and Humber, um, he messaged me and he told me about Pat Hennessy and he was like, Hey, you know, you should go on Twitter and you should check out what this guy has to say. I think you'd really enjoy it. Um, and then I just got on the hat, got in the habit of, Hey, if I'm looking for ideas and I want to, um, have things that I can do either myself or just to, um, spur articles or to encourage, encourage readers to look at. Um, and so it just became this thing. And now, you know, I pretty much go on Twitter every day. So, hmm. uh, yeah, it, it's um, it's a privilege. It's great to be able to um, be able to take great ideas that other people have and you know disperse it or uh, proliferate it. Yeah, I, I was very skeptical of Twitter at first, but as far as to for what we're sort of doing, disseminating information, it, it has been a, a great resource for that. Um, and maybe that's why the stock's been rallying recently. It was stuck at around 17 for like years. Yeah. Now all of a sudden it's broken out and it's what forties yeah. now. It's amazing. It's crazy. And they had something else too. Like the same guy that does Twitter. Um, I can't remember his name right now. Um, I think it's Dorsey, the guy that did square. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. It, it, and what else does he do? He does Twitter and he does a uh, square maybe square. Uh, or yeah. something else. Yeah. 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 And he's, he's really doing pretty well. I think on both of them from, from what I saw, I saw um, Bespoke we had an article on um, Pat Dorsey stocks, I don't know, a month or so ago. Good for him. He's rocking it. Yeah, let's see. Uh, Jack Dorsey, founder of CEO of Twitter and Square. Yeah, so he like jumps in a limo and goes from place to place or something like that. Yeah, it's amazing. That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's amazing. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. Um, and uh, it's been great catching up with you. And... Um, It'll be interesting to see what you come up with next because um, I, I know that we all love listening to uh, reading your articles every week and somebody posts them on our, our forum and Facebook every week and we, we love to check them out. Uh, people who are watching, do continue to hit that, smash that like button and definitely subscribe to, yeah. um, to the channel. Um, now, can people get, I know that you have sort of like a private Twitter account. Can people subscribe to that? Yeah, people can. And I always within a day or two, um, you know, let people in. Uh, the only reason I do that, I just like to uh, press that button so I know a little bit about who's following me. I've never said no to someone. I've never hmm. said no, you can't follow me. Um, it's just a good way for me to have to, um, to have to see what they're about, you know, and, and, and what it is that, that they do. So, um, yeah, but, but usually it really does. It, it takes no longer than a day or two to, nice. uh, for me to accept the, request awesome well thanks so much for your time today uh great talking to you and hopefully we can catch up with you again soon i hope so it's always great talk talking with you dave all right great and thanks everybody for watching today and um we will see you again shortly on the short vol show thanks again stay with me just for a sec adam after we uh go to break here thanks all right that's that's i'm off